Welcome to the Summer of Bonhoeffer. This is my seminary life, and I am your host, Brandon Knight, and we are here today to kick off the new summer series, The Summer of Bonhoeffer, where every week throughout the next three months, we're going to be looking at the different writings, lectures, sermons, what have you, on uh, or written by the famous Lutheran German theologian from the 1930s and 40s, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm. And to, to get started on a series about a Lutheran, I thought it made sense to bring a Lutheran along. So here he is, a friend of the show, friend of mine in general, Pastor Will Rose of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill. Pastor Will, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Yeah, your favorite past Lutheran pastor named Will. You know, I'll take yeah, for sure. I don't, I don't know if you have any other uh, Lutheran pastor friends named Will, but I'll, I'll claim like your favorite one named Will. That is that is for sure. And yeah, you I don't hung have out. Any other we hung Lutheran out. Friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you um, you you actually we hung out in person not that long ago, and you actually came yeah. to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church and hung out and slept here. And I took you to some there. favorite <laughs> restaurants. You we grilled out at my house. You met my dog. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was good times. So. I was yeah. really interested. Not that I didn't believe you, but I was really interested to know because you you always say we're on the doorstep of the University of North Carolina. And the whole time I'm right. thinking, OK, that's not a real distance of measurement. What is the doorstep? <laughs> and you're not kidding. Like in my head, I'm picturing like like a road, like you're going to go down the block, down a couple blocks, and then there's the university. Like, no, you're surrounded by frat houses and sorority houses. Like, it's mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. a minute walk. That was, yeah, yeah that is the doorstep. And you're at the <laughs> you're on Franklin Street with great, you know, restaurants and, and hangouts and all that stuff. So, yeah, I got to take you to some of my favorite places on campus. Around. I I didn't – I we tried to get you to the Dean Dome to yeah. see like, where they play basketball, but – they were having like graduations and stuff. So uh, they blocked us with yeah, a, you like know, a road, literal roadblock. A literal, literal roadblock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did not see that one coming. But right, hey, right. maybe I'll be out there again. It was a good time. There was a few yeah. things I didn't get to do that I will definitely look forward to coming back. And, you know, mm-hmm. that couch in the youth group room, that's pretty comfy. It was. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah, worked. Sure is. Served there's been purpose. there's been some afternoons when I hit the wall and I'm like I need to do a little reading. I'll go upstairs, lay on the couch, and I get like one paragraph in, and then I wake up 45 minutes later. Oh boy, okay, time to get going. It's what you really needed, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sabbath. Any, anyway, so starting out today, we're not going to be spending time looking at any one of Bonhoeffer's writings in particular. We might touch on several just briefly, but we're not here to analyze any of his writings in depth today. Instead, Pastor Will, I want us to answer the question, why? Why Mm. bother? Why why does this guy's work matter? Because Bonhoeffer has been a very influential theologian for decades now, but it really does seem like within the past 10 years or so, there's been this resurgence of interest in Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Now, Hmm. you're a Lutheran. Hmm. He's one of your guys. So this is why I think you're like one of the best people to have this conversation with. So let's just start out there with why do you think Bonhoeffer is so popular again. What do you have any theories as to why people are really into his work right now? Yeah, I think like the questions that he raises are are timeless in terms of like the main question, how does uh, in, if we take our faith seriously, if we take following Jesus seriously, if we take discipleship, that is being a discipleship be, being a disciple of Jesus seriously, then what shape does that take in the world? What what does that mm. look like? And so as we're confronted with challenges in life, life transitions, but also uh, with our own sin and brokenness, the sin and brokenness of systems and structures and governments and war, um, we have to, we bump up, we, that's an ageless question of what does it look like to follow Jesus? What kind of mm-hmm. shape? does Christ take in, in the world? And then we, as his body, as the church, how, how does, what shape does the church take in the world in terms of living our lives as the body of Christ in the world? So those, those are the timeless questions. So he, he, um, you know, we'll, we'll reference, uh, Dr. Um, 
Jeffrey Pugh um, later on in, in his book, but but he he lifted up this kind of um, understanding that that um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was just an ordinary guy from an educated family who wanted to study academia and theology, but he mm. was thrust into an extraordinary time and probably war times in worst times in world history in terms of World War II and one of the worst regimes that humanity could ever produce. And he was kind of thrust in there and with those particular questions, um, really lifted to the surface some some a, a role model of not only how to articulate how to follow Jesus, but also Mm. in how he lived his life, literally being martyred for his faith and his resistance against Hitler and, and nationalism and and those Mm -hmm. things. So, and injustice. So I think that's why, and then, you know, we, we, in our scriptures, we have uh, St. Paul who wrote letters from a prison. You know, mm-hmm. and it's some timeless Christology and how to be the church and how to follow Jesus. Well, here is mm-hmm. Bonhoeffer was also thrown into prison, and there he was sitting sitting with, alone with his thoughts and and thought through what does that look like and how am I a Christian? How do I follow Christ? And 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 so his writings from prison endured and and what he wrote there. And then you know, similar to Martin Luther King Jr., who from a letter from a Birmingham jail sat with his thoughts and wrote a timeless letter um, to the church and what does it mean to be the church in the world. So I think those themes are are there. Yeah, I find that with Bonhoeffer, with the little that I have started reading and what I've been studying in the past, that practical theology that you're talking about of how do how do I apply this now? More than just application, but like thinking it through of what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And a lot of the things that he is focusing on to make practical of, you know, living at wartime, pursuing peace, being a disciple of Jesus, uh, living in community is one of his big things that he comes back to a lot. These are all very, um, these are all topics that are very popular and are very important to millennials and Gen Z right now. You know, the millennials and Gen Z, they're the ones who are really pushing for that authentic community living in discipleship with one another that, you know, I don't know if he was necessarily ahead of his time, but that was for sure a big part of Bonhoeffer's life with uh, the cost of discipleship or uh, blinking on the title. We are going to talk about life together. That's one of his Mm -hmm, works that we mm -hmm. are going to talk about just these. And you even brought up like the nationalism aspect that the Nazi regime kind of mixed nationalism with a little bit of Christianity light and speaking out against the nationalism while still like embracing the fact that he's German, you know, like he doesn't Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. cut that off completely. So, yeah, I think he was focusing in on. Uh, important subjects that are timeless and are currently with the current crop of young theologians, myself and included, are very passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. And he could have had a very cushy academic job in at Union Seminary in New York, right? He came mm-hmm. over and, and he could have stayed here and, and, lived out his life writing and speaking to things and thinking mm-hmm. through stuff and writing books. But he's like, nope, I'm going back to my homeland to to resist um, and and to make a difference there in the midst of it. He had another chance to come back over to the States and he went to New York and didn't stay very long and came, went back home and said, nope, nope, this is this one. He had a, he had a pastor, he pastored a congregation in London um, at a German speaking congregation there at one point, but then came back um, to, to Germany. So he had opportunities that he could have said like, nope, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be safe here and have a family and, and live out my, my life and sure. faith this way, but decided to hop back in and live his life too. And I, you know, speaking, you know, as, as a Lutheran pastor, I knew of him growing up mm-hmm. in the church, his name was thrown around a little bit, but didn't, you know, I was kind of a clueless kid, kind of a surfer kid that didn't pay attention to much until really <laughs> college and, and then seminary. And then while I was at seminary, one of the first things they had us read was life together. And to be honest, like I read it and it was important and I knew about him, but I don't know how much stuck just because I was so nervous about seminary in general, what I'm going to make mm. in Greek. When am I preaching? Leading worship. Sure. I, I had to yeah. get up in front of people, you know, like what kind of grades am I, what, what a cert- church am I going to be assigned to in my contextual education? or <laughs> All those things were revolving around my head. So I didn't quite pay as close attention or has sink in, but it was later digging more into his work, understanding um, like his work when it comes to Lutherans are all about grace. 
And there's kind of mm-hmm. timeless um, Reformation question of like, what shape does our faith take in the world and uh, justified by by grace through faith. But then he wrote, you know, it's, it's there's a difference between cheap grace and costly yeah. grace. Uh, Paul wrote to that as well. Um, Luther wrote to that as well. And then Bonhoeffer lived it up as well too you know this idea of of costly grace and that discipleship faith in action it's not just mm-hmm. a passive thing an academic thing what what does it look like in action so that that's that's what stands um a, across time and, and i also shared that you know as a lutheran pastor i just uh this past spring um went to germany mm-hmm. Uh, with our campus ministry students to do a tour of these spots, historic spots where where Martin Luther um, mm. lived and died and did did his work. And so our campus pastor every few years takes a group of students over there and has done that tour. And this is the first time I was able to go over there. So I went to Wittenberg, I went to Wartburg, mm. I went to these places where Luther lived and breathed and did his work. And while we're over there, Germany acknowledges some of the harmful words that Luther said about Jews. His mm. anti-Semitism, mm-hmm. and even uh, my own denomination, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, has come out and repented from that and asked for forgiveness for those those words. And even some of our students were like, you know, what what do we do with Luther? You know, in this kind of cancel culture, like, mm-hmm. all right, um, w- what do we do with Luther? Who we acknowledge what he did in terms of church history and the ports he is to the Reformation mm-hmm. and and how we understand being a Christian. But he said these awful things. So how do we? How do we handle Luther? Do we just cancel him outright? Take some of them, mm-hmm. just acknowledge that he got older and cantankerous and had you know, bowel problems and you know all those things mm-hmm. and said, yeah, yeah. was that was that his ulcer speaking? And you're like, well, wh- whatever. It's, not, and it's inexcusable. So mm-hmm. even Hitler and the Nazis were able to use Luther's words uh, to justify what they did uh, in mm-hmm. terms of the Holocaust. But while we were over there in Germany and we were talking about these things, I was like, hey, hey, students, let me also lift up somebody – who is also one of our own, who resisted uh, the Nazis, who resisted Hitler, who resisted anti-Semitism, who saw mm-hmm. the injustice. And and he's one of our own. He not only did, did this arise out of what you could say some of, of Lutheranism itself um, that we're not very proud of, but it also produced uh, Bonhoeffer. A, a, mm-hmm. As a hero, uh, as a resistance against that, and a martyr. So, so we kind of held those in tension with each other. And some mm-hmm. some of our students had never heard of Bonhoeffer, and we were able to lift up and mm-hmm. say, "Hey, you know, here, here's someone you re- really need to study when it comes to how to handle these big issues because it is prevalent, right? You know, Christian yeah. nationalism is on the rise. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of comparisons with." <laughs> You know, make America great again, and then you know Hitler's saying, "Let's make Germany great again." All those things mm-hmm. coming around, um, uh, r- not necessarily repeating, but definitely have some some rhyming going on, and and yeah. we need to be aware of that. So, we were able to talk about those subjects with our students and and lift that up. There's even been I've seen reports of hashtags of like anti-Semitism, like hashtags mm-hmm. that are skyrocketing. Like last mm-hmm. year, it was one of the most tweeted things was this specific anti-Semitic uh, hashtag. And yeah, there's a, you know, I've only, I've read one thing, which is going to be for next week's episode already. And mm-hmm. there's just so much parallelism, you know, not one for one specifically, but just so much paraliz- parallelism mm-hmm. between where Bonhoeffer was at. You know, this the thing I was reading I'm going to talk about next week comes in the 1930s when he was here in New York for right. his little uh, visit to Union Seminary. And just seeing these parallels between, you know, Christian nationalism and the nationalism mm-hmm. of Germany uh, talking about, you know, even these uh, similar situations to Ukraine and Russia relations Mm -hmm. that we have now with the war going on over there. It's interesting how cyclical history can be, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought this up though. I was curious, every denomination has their heroes, you know, obviously with you guys, your namesake, Martin Luther, or even like for me growing up in the Baptist church, Everyone has like this general idea who of who Charles Spurgeon is, kind of the big right. one of the biggest na- uh, claims to fame that the Baptist Church has with Spurgeon. So I was curious if this is kind of like with you guys, if Bonhoeffer is like this other pillar. If you have your Mount Rushmore of Lutherans, if it's Luther and Bonhoeffer and two other people that I have no idea who they would be, but. Um, <laughs> But it sounds right. like it's a little bit of this, like definitely important in seminary, but maybe not as common knowledge to know who D. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, even in the Lutheran church. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, we're part of systematic ecology. So it's kind of like, mm-hmm. it's kind of like in geek, fa- geek uh, terms, like there's the people who know the the Star Wars movies, uh, but then there are those who like know the extra shows on Disney plus and the canon and sure. the novels and the, how deep yeah, you yeah, yeah. go in your nerdum. Same with Lutheran theology. I okay. like the general laity knows who Luther is and probably heard of Bonhoeffer, but it's the, the theology nerds, the, the Lutheran gotcha. nerds who really get into it, who dive deeper into those things. So they might've heard the name of those guys or just in kind of world history under him, but in terms of like mm-hmm. read the original words that he wrote from prison or life together or cost of discipleship, mm-hmm. those kinds of works, you know? Um, and, and we talk about them a little bit in, in confirmation and youth group and lift okay. them up with our campus ministry. But again, like, 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 teenage will and college will there's only so much the brain can soak up or what you're oh, worried yeah. about and what you retain um but you you hopefully introduce some of these themes and topics and who this man is and why he was so important especially with attention on the line in terms of what luther said and mm-hmm. some of the things luther did towards the end of his life and then saying but also uh part of our heritage is this guy who who stood up to fascism who who resisted um and and then yeah that brought up we talked about you know, his life, similar to Luther, Luther, you know, took a pilgrimage to Rome, had some disillusionment, had, Mm -hmm. um, you know, was a, and then had a, a, an awakening moment, you know, he woke up and tried to wake up others to, to what was going on around him. And, and same with Bonhoeffer, like when he came to union and, and, and mate his, met his friend who was, um, African-American who, um, saw with his own eyes, what was going on in Harlem and injustice mm-hmm. with, with, uh, people of color. And then meeting his friend from France who had kind of a pacifist understanding and, and had debates about war and just war and, and, and violence. And so those, those visits, um, and pilgrimages and relationships is what broadened him to see the world in a deeper way that he wanted to take church and how we do church and how we do faith on, mm-hmm. on another level in a deeper way as well. I think it's really beautiful too. You you talked about this earlier with the this coming of full circle of like the these problematic things that Martin Luther did say there towards mm-hmm. the end of his uh, ministry life, which. We'll talk about him, I'm sure, but Eric Metaxas in his biography on Martin Luther, very good, very good biography, but does kind of like, mm. he's bending, a, he's bending him backwards to try and make that Glossing section work, a little but, bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Just, <laughs> but you know, problematic nonetheless, but you have this beautiful, like, you know, centuries or hundreds of years later of then here's another guy of the same camp in a situation that is partially the result of what Luther, you know, said and is able to rise up and defend the true gospel still in the process, but also actively work against the power machine Mm -hmm. of the Nazis in Germany during that time. It's a, it's a beautiful story, I think, particularly for, Lutherans in Germany of just these two pillars being able to complement each other in the long term, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So you said that, you know, high school college will was kind of the first exposure, maybe didn't like retain the information as well because Greek and Hebrew and all the other pressures that poor <laughs> fear preaching. Fear yeah. of preaching, <laughs> how to spend money, you know, all those important things. Right. Uh, I think that was the same for me was right around college. When I was in college is when Eric Metaxas's biography on Bonhoeffer came out. And he actually mm-hmm. spoke on campus shortly after he did the um, uh, national prayer breakfast. He recycled the speech and did the speech again for us. Uh, for right. our, one of our chapel services, but it was actually, I didn't read it. I didn't read that book because, you know, you read so much stuff when you're in right. college and seminary. I don't have time to read. That is a thick book. I don't have time. So I read that like later on. I think it was a summer read for me for fun. Um, but the my first like real exposure to Bonhoeffer's teachings was in the weirdest of ways. I was in a doctrines class. And everybody had to do a group presentation on a doctrine that you don't believe. And so for kicks and giggles, I signed up and one of my friends signed up for God is dead theology. And uh, apparently 
God is Dead theology is partially inspired by two things that are completely ripped out of context. First is Frederick Nietzsche talking about God is dead. We live in a society where God is dead. Society has killed God. And then also Bonhoeffer talking about living in a society without God, which comes completely ripped out of context from his um, prison letters, I believe. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first exposure. And it was so like, who is this guy? Nice. You know? Nice. And that inspired me to dig deeper. And much like my love for C.S. Lewis, a lot of my love for Bonhoeffer comes from the way that he writes. I just if I could write like him, I don't know how he was as a preacher. I've never heard him, nor would I. I mean, it's going to be speaking German, so I don't know if I would really be able to follow anyway. But uh, the way that he writes is very, it's it's very inspiring and it's very thoughtful as well, Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And he, you know, writing from prison and in Mm -hmm. another book or um, share a little bit, Dr. Pugh's religionless Christianity. And you talk Mm -hmm. about like he's wrestling with the Institute and can we can relate to with Gen Z and our Mm -hmm. our own culture is like, you know, the, the disillusionment with organized religion Mm -hmm. and a church that claims Christ, but not living as Christ in the world. And these kind of dual system are like, all right, you claim Christ, but yet how are you acting in the world? And doesn't look a lot like what, Jesus taught or did or lived or, or, or died or rose again. It doesn't look mm-hmm. like him. So, so how do you justify the between? So he's looking at as this kind of disillusionment and deconstruction of like, Hey, um, here's, here's what the church should be. And, and that's selling out uh, to mm-hmm. the, to the lust of power and, um, being in control or bowing down to, to Nazism and, and nationalism and, and selling out. And so, yeah, I, how do I separate that from the actual words of, of Jesus himself? So you have Jesus without uh, religion or, or the institution mm-hmm. of it. And so those kind of things are, are um, I think, pre- prevalent and relevant to our own conversation in terms of what the church looks like or should do in yeah, a post COVID sure. post Trumpism punch, you know, Christian nationalism has a rise. What does the church look like? All those things, um, no matter how you vote, it definitely raises the question of what does it mean to follow Jesus? What should the church be doing or not doing? And, and again, like the tax is a term of, of his, um, his his book on Bonhoeffer, Dr. Pugh will also share that in, in his book that 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 Bonhoeffer is kind of like a Rorschach uh, test that you kind of get mm. out what you want out of him. You can kind of use him to justify for whatever you want or need when mm-hmm. it comes to like if you want to take up violence because you feel justified in that again or, or you know, well. Bonhoeffer did. He has an, he had an assassination attempt on Hitler. So I, I'm going to stand up for right and do, do, do the same. And so that, those kinds of things, um, you know, I think is relevant when it comes to having a conversation around Bonhoeffer. So let's talk about those two books. Yeah. The two biographies, or at least the, I know the Metaxas one is a biography. Um, I did not know until probably within the past year that there are some people who don't like that book. Now, for right. me, this was actually a big turning point for me in my theology was reading this biography and just at least getting exposed to the life of Bonhoeffer. I don't think I would be at where I am now without having read this biography. But apparently there are some issues. Do you know what these issues are and would like to elaborate? Because I know you said you would rather endorse dr pew's book so let's hear yeah, what you yeah. have to and, say and um yeah dr jeffrey pew who taught at elon college not far from from chapel hill mm. um wrote his book in 2008 2009 so it's before okay. trump was was elected but i but i think his problem mm. and his critique and i didn't read metax's book uh, all i know okay. is that like you have this book about a biography of bonhoeffer resisting nationalism and kind of mm-hmm. the lust or quest for power. And then, it, and, and talking about that resistance. And then as soon as your side of the political party 
rises to power, you but then and Metaxas being a Trump supporter and being like, oh, cool. Yeah, we don't need to resist anymore. We're now in power. So now we have to align ourselves with with empire rather than resist against it. Mm -hmm. So I think that those are the critiques against it. It's like you talk a big game, but oh, now that we're in power, um, mm. I, 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 I'm now justified in in being bedfellows with those in power gotcha. and, and glossing over that. So it's, it's kind of hypocritical, a kind of hypocritical uh, a take. And I think Dr. Pugh it will, will come out and say that it's just, just a wrong take. He just has a wrong take mm -hmm. on, on Bonhoeffer. And then, yeah, Dr. Pugh talks about his life, but it, the name of the book is Religionless Christianity, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in okay. Troubled Times. And and so, so yeah, I, I do um, recommend that book and his work. And um, a friend of mine, Trip Fuller, does, you know, he, he's been on systematic ecology and um, mm -hmm. his his homebrew Christianity class is doing a whole, whole like online class workshop series on Bonhoeffer with with him and Dr. Pugh leading that with other oh, scholars. Okay. And so, so, um, and, you know, it's an online class you can sign up for, and they definitely have, have had lectures and they speak to some of that too. And of course they're on the, the left of things, whereas Metex is on the right. So again, this Bonhoeffer is kind of lightning rod where both sides can say, I claim him as my, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, so, and they both find ways to do that, but, but there's not too many historical figures that, uh, um, that, that's free from that. Like any historical mm -hmm. figure, and kind of look at through a certain lens and say, claim them as your own, you know, but, but, but yeah, that's kind of the gist of it for now without knowing all the intricate detail. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. It is funny. You do have these certain theologians that like everybody loves, everybody loves CS Lewis and completely forgets the part that he's Anglican. Like he's the mm -hmm. other category, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but everybody, you know, it's very few people who actually don't like Lewis. Um, but yeah, you have, I also have this understanding that I even picked up on it when I read Metaxas's biography is uh, he's tr although there's a lot of nationalism. And like you said, this whole like fighting against the quest for power type of narrative in Bonhoeffer's life, Metaxas draws a lot of comparisons to like the fight in America against abortion. And even as like a, 20 young 20 year old reading this book i'm like how is this connecting i'm not seeing mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. these are relating but okay i will have to add religionless christianity by dr pew to my never-ending list of books to read um you uh <laughs> you mentioned it earlier us being a part of systematic geekology pastor will are there any comic books on the life oh. of bonhoeffer a, a graphic novel, you maybe would a say? graphic novel, you would say. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk. I'm gonna show it to the people at home in case they're watching. There we go. It's called uh, "The Faithful Spy: uh, A True Story: Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the Plot to Kill Hitler" by John Hendricks. And okay, and so this it does um it doesn't go too deep into Bonhoeffer's theology as much as kind of the historical world uh, rise of of. Hitler's rise to power and okay. Bonhoeffer's life and response to that. So it's definitely leans hard into what's going on in post World War One, uh, the 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 Great okay. Depression, and then the World War Two and Hitler's rise to power, and then what Bonhoeffer did with that. It does talk about his theology, son, but it's mainly okay. like this resistance and him being a spy and a quest to assassinate him. And, gotcha. And his life is kind of doing an alternative rebel seminary and the confessing church mm -hmm. versus like the, the state Lutheran church of the day that was kind of in bed with Hitler and, and didn't resist at all. And kind of the arm of that. So, and okay. it's, it's good. It's, it's, and I'll share, it's not just graphic novel in terms of pictures, sure. boom, pal, and um, <laughs> like word, word bubbles. There's a lot of text in here with pictures and graphics mm. to help lead you into the story. And I found it very helpful, very neat, uh, very sad. By the time I got to the end to when, mm -hmm literally um bonhoeffer was, was hung they don't have a picture of him being hung but they they lived that part of that reality in 1945 uh, before he even reached 40 years old um mm -hmm. he he was a, he he was killed and um executed by the state and hung um months before uh, the war ended and and hitler killed himself and so he was like mm -hmm. man he almost made it he was almost liberated yeah. he almost was able to see the end of this regime but but didn't quite get there so we got to the end i got kind of emotional there then as you, yeah. you read this story and, and his life and what he sought to do and and resist against and then by and then him literally being martyr executed by the state um uh 
it, pretty pretty moving. So it's it's a fantastic mm. book when it comes from that angle and more the politics and what was going on. I'm gonna say something real nerdy. I really like that cover. That is so oh, good so art good. on that cover. It is so good. And <laughs> and there's some good. there there's some really moving um, you know, so you just have like a picture of Bonhoeffer and like his life and kind of you mm. read around it and, and see That's some cool. things. But then but then you know, like Hitler who saw himself as a wolf, you know, uh, the yeah. leader. Uh, and then the text okay. beside it talking about talking about that. So um yeah, it is a graphic novel use mm-hmm. graphics to show show that <laughs> um and and so yeah and, and it brings up the book you know in terms of um i think bonhoeffer what he wanted to ask the question is like all right um who who's your who's your leader um who mm. is your god are you following hitler or are you following god um what's, yeah. what's the idol that, that you're chasing and i i think the um very much a conversation in terms of how we do church and politics in our present mm-hmm. day age too which is why it's a timeless question, a timeless figure to study and important now more than ever to dive into and look and explore. So great that you're doing that this summer. Yeah. And you know, you got me thinking a little bit here, uh, something I had never considered before. So he was 40 or just shy of being 40 when yeah. he is killed. And like you said, just several months later, it's all over. The war's over. He would, he almost made it. And it's really interesting to think about, although he wrote a lot, he preached a lot, he taught a lot. It's really, you know, we only have like a very specific young man, really, you know, even just to his forties, just a young man. And he would be, you know, he would probably have not, he would probably not still be alive today if he would have made it. But, you know, it's kind of like looking at, okay, here's an example that maybe not everybody will picture but like nirvana kurt cobain passing Mm -hmm. away so young the band is like in a very specific time frame and in a very specific like they did not age they are forever those three albums we don't get to know what it would have been like nowadays and it's interesting to think about like if bonhoeffer would have lived would have made it like what would have the next 10, 20, 30, even 40 more years of theology and writing, what that would have looked like, how that could have shifted Christianity globally. I don't because that takes you all the way to the eighties, but you know, if he lived another 40 years response to like uh, the Vietnam war or, or the cold war to to Reagan in power, um, communism, um, you know, the Eastern Bloc, the, you know, in terms of, uh, Germany split, you know, the, the Berlin wall, you know, Mm -hmm. the, 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 having commentary on that, how, how he would have spoken for against or, or in light of those things. And, and, shed shed his wisdom and how he would evolve because i know man i i think different um than when i was oh yeah in my 30s you know or oh, or, yeah. or coming out of seminary i'm a 50 year old guy and and i've, I've evolved there's still we are those there's still will i'm still there's continuity there i'm still the same person i was but mm-hmm. in terms of how i've evolved and grown in my life um yeah and be, be interested to see how how he would have progressed or or grew in terms of his um on the world stage of theology yes. Yeah, his commentary, the potent, the idea of him having thoughts on Vietnam, that that's really interesting to me. As we start to wrap this episode up, do you have any other quick recommendations? We've tossed a lot of books around. Is there any other sitting there that you want to highlight real quick before we get out of here? Yeah, I think, you know, there are books about the person, but I, I do think, you know, reading his own words is is important. Life Together mm-hmm. is a short book about yeah. about community. Uh, Cost of Discipleship, a little bit longer, but but it definitely leans into that kind of understanding of what is the difference between cheap grace and costly grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he wrote a book called Ethics, and then his letters from prison, I think, are really important too. So I, th- I think reading his own words alongside mm-hmm. a good biography or, or what, or, or people putting him in light of world history then and now uh, reading his own words, I think it's important. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about life together in July, I think is the plan as of right now. We're going to talk about nice. that in its completion uh, in July. So I wanted to do the cost of discipleship, but it is a longer one. So if it we do longer. this again, if we do this series again in the future, maybe I'll start it early. <laughs> so that way I actually yeah. have time to 
get to it. And maybe I'll read a graphic novel too along the way. There you go. Yes, the graphic novel is a, a pretty good, easy read. And I think, man, mm. maybe I'll, re- I'll reread Life Together in light of your yeah. in, in July. And then yeah. I can reminisce about seminary, reading that seminary, but then also <laughs> probably looking at it through a different lens now, um, you know, 20 some years later. That sure. That would be, that'd be good. For sure. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Will, for helping yeah, us glad I get could. this conversation started a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for listening to today's episode. Remember, if you ever need to find links for anything important, you can go into the description of this episode, find links to the MSL website and shop, follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can always reach out at email seminarylife at gmail.com. Pastor Will and I are both associated with Systematic Geekology, where the priests of the geeks talk about comic books, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Marvel, anime. If it's out there, there's probably an episode on it. (laughs) Pastor Will and I and TJ are all very eagerly awaiting Dune Part 2 later this year to watch and Mm -hmm. talk about it. It's going to be good. And you can find this show and Systematic Ecology over on the Anazao Ministries Podcast Network alongside several other great shows as well. Hey, we got a really heavy season coming up ahead here on the show because next week we're going to be talking about uh, a lecture Bonhoeffer gave about how World War One and the Treaty of Versailles uh, really tore up the German people, really tore up Germany and how uh, him pleading for sympathy towards the Germans. So Hmm. with all of this in mind, if you need something light to listen to, just last week on the show for the School's Out special, my brother Bradley and I discussed one of our favorite childhood movies. We would watch it every summer to kick off the year or kick off the summertime school's out. We would watch recess school's out. So it's just a fun time of me and him (laughs) talking about this movie. We don't try to shove Jesus into it because that would be rude to try and do. Uh, So yeah, if you need a little bit of a lighter, enjoyable thing before we get into all the heaviness, go check out that episode as well. Nice. Thank you again, Pastor Will, for being here. Yeah, glad to be here. Do good work. Proud of oh, you. Oh yeah. Man. Proud of. Thank you. Thank you. And it was so. Th- I am continuously so thankful for all the hospitality that you gave us during the convention, letting me sleep rent free for a period for a few nights, mm-hmm. taking me out. It was great. Thank you for listening. And remember, this is Brandon signing off, reminding you as always that theology is for everyone. So keep on studying.